Today, I'm going to follow up on questions that I've recently asked atheists with more questions. I'd rather hear a rebuttal to the answers given by atheists. This shouldn't be a one-way street. Let's do this. <laughs> Greetings, fellow space travelers. Bionic Dance here. If you're even a casual viewer of YouTube atheist videos, you've probably seen the 11 questions that atheists cannot answer vid, plus a fair number of replies to it. Personally, I thought her video was dull as dishwater, but apparently the rest of you didn't agree. Well, I can admit when I've flamingoed up, so when a new video came out with more questions, well, allow me to retort. The first question is a little long, so hang on for a second and let me explain. Despite the culture or era, sane humans have the innate sense of what's right and what's wrong, and we prefer to do what's right to help our fellow humans. Right and wrong are such misleading terms. The implication is that there's a standard of correct and incorrect behavior that is just as formulaic and demonstrable as 1 plus 1 equals 2. But this isn't a case of correct or incorrect as it would be with a math problem. She says it herself, we prefer to do what's right to help our fellow humans, a preference in order to achieve a goal. This comes with a lot of complications. First is the establishment of that goal as something we desire, something to strive for. What is the source of this desire? Second, that right and wrong, as she's stated it, refer to behavior, to the method of achieving that goal, rather than whether the goal itself is right or wrong. Third, that our method of achieving the goal might be less desirable than the goal itself, the problem of the ends not justifying the means. And fourth, that every last scrap of this depends on our subjective perspective, and that everybody will agree with our preferences or reasoning, and we have no method of determining who is right or wrong that isn't similarly opinion-based. Obviously, it's not the cut-and-dried scenario she seems to be picturing. No matter the major religion, we are all aware of the golden rule. We prefer the humble over the braggarts, the selfless over the selfish, and the truthful over the liars. But why? Why do we desire these things? Your average theist will tell us that God instilled it within us, but ask yourself, is that really necessary? I prefer to live pain and hunger free. You probably do too. If we mutually agree to not hurt or starve each other, we'll probably enjoy life a heck of a lot more. So we don't do it. There. Golden rule. No God required. Cross-cultural scholars, such as Gert Hofstede, Fons Trompenars, Robert House, and Shalom Schwartz have found that societies vary in ways inconsistent with our innate morality. Maybe our morality isn't as innate as some would have us believe. Maybe the morality we do have isn't as inviolable as some would have us believe. And maybe some people are just plain jerks. For example, not all societies are considered collective or cooperative. Collective societies are in Asia, Northern Europe, the Arab region, Africa, and South America. Highly individualistic societies are in Western Europe, the United States, and Canada. Many societies in the world are hedonistic, hierarchical, and have preferences against gender egalitarianism. So what we ought to do is often inconsistent with what we are doing. Again, she makes the mistake of thinking that there is a universal ought, that we can't make our own oughts. Set a goal and the methods to strive for it, and that is your ought to you, and to anybody you can persuade to agree with you, assuming that they don't already feel the same way. And if they don't, there may be trouble. Finding a mutually beneficial and agreed-upon goals and methods is ideal, but not a guarantee. And so writing a goals and method rulebook into a religion backed by the fist of a god probably sounds lovely. Everybody has to agree and conform or face the consequences. But now you're left with the task of proving your religion true, otherwise nobody has a reason to follow your goals and methods. Evolutionary biologists have made observations to show that cooperative societies were better poised for survival, and over thousands of years in the distant past, groups have fared better than individuals. Yet even in historical times, we have examples of highly individualist and highly successful societies such as those in ancient Greece and Rome. 
The premise is that cooperative groups are better poised for survival. It was not said that there were guarantees. Nature is flexible. Just because you found an exception or three does not invalidate the conclusion. Also, these examples are nothing of the kind. I'm not certain she quite understands the concepts. Individualism is not a kind of chaotic, every-man-for-himself mindset that can bring down a society. There is still cooperation in an individualist society. The difference is in priority, in balance, and not a completely different day-to-day -day life. And her exception examples are wrong, too. Ancient Rome was very much a collectivist society rather than individualistic. It was assumed that some people were naturally inferior, meant to be ruled, and individuals had very little power over their own fates. The prosperity and expansion of the empire took precedence. Slavery was rampant. Even soldiers were executed for not living up to fighting standards as a message to the rest of the troops to keep up their performance. And that disregard for the individual over the group is why the empire spread as it did. Her understanding and examples simply don't hold up under scrutiny, and it sounds as though she's working backward from her conclusion. So why do even individualists know that we ought to help the weak, feed the poor, and be honest, just, empathetic, and loving? They know this. They even do this. Do we live on the same planet? How many times have you heard a politician, or one of their sycophants, saying that poor people shouldn't get food stamps because they're being freeloaders? Have you seen the protests about police brutality that seems to be focused on the lower class folks rather than ritzy rich people? We don't know that we ought to do this at all. We feel it. At least, some of us do. Emotions do not tell us facts, nor do they describe the world outside of our own heads. And the golden rule is what we'd like to see, not what's there regardless of our collective perspective. Two, what accounts for the empty tomb and the resurrection appearances of Jesus? This is the one I'm skipping. There are other people who can do it better than me, who have all of their sources and data, who can give you names and dates and such. But my basic understanding is that a lot of what is written about the tomb was actually done decades later, and not by the people who were there, whose names are attached to the writings. Extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, not just people writing about the alleged event. Those writings are the claim, not the evidence. And let's face it, a guy rising from the dead, God's brat or not, is a pretty extraordinary claim. We're in why doesn't God heal amputees territory here. This example is from thousands of years ago. In the age of cameras, we've seen nothing similar, recording nothing with scientific equipment which could run tests to verify what we're seeing. So either a completely unprecedented and unfollowed resurrection happened, or we're at the far end of the world's longest game of telephone. You know, I heard Skinner say the teachers will crack any minute. Skinner said the teachers will crack any minute purple monkey dishwasher. Which do you really think is more likely? Three, if an atheist position is that the universe is the product of chance and necessity instead of the product of intelligence, how can he or she explain the fact that the universe is structured rationally, logically, and with mathematical precision and predictability? Theists love saying chance as if that's the only possibility besides deliberate action. Rolling dice doesn't rely on chance, but rather on human inability to calculate all of the relevant data in order to predict the result. And that's a perfect metaphor for the rest of the universe. What looks random to our bare eyes actually isn't, but also doesn't require an intelligence in order to be or to happen. Do we necessarily have an explanation for why the universe functions as it does rather than in some other fashion? No. Not really. Not yet. But that doesn't mean you get to plug God into the gap until there is another answer. Look at how many times that has already failed after science got more advanced. I recognize that not having answers can be uncomfortable or scary, but that's life, and relying on an unprovable super being for a security blanket isn't going to do you any favors. Pope Benedict XVI said, If nature is really structured with a mathematical language, and mathematics invented by man can manage to understand it, this demonstrates something extraordinary. What is she or this pope pretending mathematics actually is or does? Yeah, okay, humans invented math, but not as some sort of secret codebook used to translate things the universe says. The universe isn't structured with a mathematical language. It's structured in a rational way, and some of its functions can be studied using the mathematical system we've devised. Math is a method of reasoning or reaching conclusions, not translation. Four, if atheists adhere to the belief that the purpose of human life is merely to procreate and survive, is it possible to determine that human life has any more value than animal life, since animals share the same basic purpose? 
Humans are animals, and value is a relative measure, not something intrinsic. If you value human life, it's probably because you are human. I value human life. I also value feline life. I love my kitty, and there's a very good chance I'd rescue her from a burning building before I'd rescue you. I don't know you at all. We don't have the same connection as I do with my Columbia. And you being human doesn't mean you're automatically more valuable. Five, why have so many atheists determined that the life of a fetus in the mother's womb is less valuable than the life of his or her mother? What standard do they use to value human life? That's just it. I'm not valuing human life. I value people. To put it metaphorically, it's not the meat, it's the man. Fetuses can't think, can't feel, can't see or hear. It's not a person. It's flesh and blood, nothing more. We have no relationship to it. We don't know it the way we know friends and family. At the very most, it's potential. The pregnant woman, however, she's someone. She has friends and a family, possibly a boyfriend or husband or lover, a career and a hobby. She's an individual. Like I said for the previous question, it's having a connection that matters. I know my kitty the way I know friends and family. She may not be human, but she's still a person. I've had lots of cats in my life, and they've each had personalities distinct from each other, and I value them far more than I'd ever value a fetus. So if a woman feels that aborting a pregnancy is necessary, be it for health reasons or simply because she's not ready to have that kind of chaos in her life, the sort of birth might bring, I value her more because of who she is, not what she is. You want to know the standard I use? That's the standard. I'm sure there are already some theists typing furious replies to this, telling me how horrible I am. Can't wait to read them. Thank you very much. I hope you still thank me after I post this reply to your comment section, assuming you even watch it. Either way, until next time, fellow space travelers, this is Bionic Dance saying don't run on automatic. Instead, please thank. Even YouTubers need Ferraris. Please donate on Patreon. If you don't like what I'm saying, there's a good chance you're the reason I'm saying it.